Yeah. Hi guys, welcome to another episode of Smash or Pass with JV, hey. me Millie, and of course Smash. Hello! So in today's episode we are going to be taking a look at Scooby-Doo and the Loch Ness Monster. So for me this is a huge nostalgia trip. Of course we've been working our way through, so if you haven't seen our reviews on like the previous movies go and check those out. But I'm really excited for today. So of course, this is the one where the gang go to Scotland. Now, for me personally, this is really, really close to home. I'm literally about an hour away from Scotland. So instantly an attachment to this movie that is going to become quite prominent, I think. Oh yeah, Scotland is up, isn't it? Oh no, JV. No, like, I just I just realised what you were saying when before we started recording. You're literally from right next to Scotland. <laughs> yes, and that's why when you mimic my voice, you do a Scottish accent. Oh my god, I actually didn't get that. I, I oh thought, god. for some reason, I thought Scotland was down. I don't oh know, no. that's London, isn't it? I'm so sorry. <laughs> Can we edit that out? No. Okay, so for those of you that haven't seen <laughs> no. the Loch Ness movie for a while... And your geography is better than JB's. Um, it's nostalgic for me because it's quite close to home. And the basic plot of this is the gang are going to Scotland and they are going to see if the Loch Ness is real or if this is just going to be another unmasking for them. And there are a few really interesting talking points. And the first one I want to throw out there is in this movie... Velma says that she believes the Loch Ness is real and I think this is a little bit of a turning point in terms of the Scooby-Doo movies because she's very much uh it's okay we're gonna unmask this why are you scared this is just gonna be a man in a costume whereas I don't know quite early on in this she's she's confident that this is real so yeah I think it's a very very prominent movie and I'm really excited to review it I mean the argument she makes for that is that you know normally she would kind of disregard supernatural things because you know they're just they're bogus essentially but she says that she believes in the lot of this monster to an extent because so many people have reported it and maybe it's because it's about a specific being in a specific place. But if you think about how many like YouTube videos or people claim, you know, aliens exist or ghosts exist, it's like, could the same logic not be used to Velma then? Like, look at all these sightings of ghosts. <laughs> like, True. it's a bit, a bit weird. But I do like how Velma isn't closed-minded straight yeah. from the start. But let's see. So we have a different cast this time around. So... We have Frank Welker as Scooby and Shaggy, Casey Kasem as... Oh, no, Scooby and Fred, Casey Kasem as Shaggy, Mindy Cohen as... Or Cohen, mm -hmm. I don't know, as Velma, and Greg Griffin yep. as Daphne. And straight from the start, Mindy does an amazing job as Velma, yeah. and Grey is amazing as Daphne. Like, I love this cast so much. Like I said, my bias towards this movie and the nostalgia is kicking in quite early. But for me, this is the perfect cast for this movie like i do have some criticisms in for future movies regarding casting and things but for this one i'm very very happy so we have skipped ahead slightly we just jumped straight into the gang going to scotland but i think there's a cold open beforehand where who is it it's daphne's cousin um is it shanice shannon shannon um Shannon, yeah. yeah. On the boat. So, opinions on that scene, because... Yeah. I don't know. Um, so, Smash, what's your opinion on, as JB was listing there, the casting and also the introduction of Daphne's cousin? Okay, so, yeah. Starting out, we do have a different cast. This is the quote-unquote What's New Scooby-Doo cast. Uh, so, this is... This isn't their first time voicing the characters, especially Grey, who did Daphne in Cyber Chase. But uh, by this point, they had been doing What's New Scooby-Doo for about two years now. Uh, this is just the first movie that they are doing these characters. Uh, I know so many people love Mindy as Velma, and I do too. I, I have nothing against her. I just, re-watching this movie, felt like... Uh, she was kind of still getting her footing into Velma. As, like, you guys said, she was pretty accepting of the Loch Ness Monster. But then, as we see in later movies with Mindy still doing Velma, she kind of does a switch of, like, no, supernatural things aren't real and whatever. And so, 
I think it's fun, but it's also a little jarring uh, for her character right now because, you know, we're hearing this new voice and Mindy has a lot she can play with because she's never been Velma and it's this new generation of Velma. But I also feel like she doesn't quite know, uh, and this could be the writing more so than Mindy herself, but where she stands with supernatural beings and elements and stuff. Uh, but uh, again, I have nothing against Mindy. Uh, she's a great Velma. It's the one I grew up with, you know, uh, with what's new Scooby-Doo and everything. Uh, as for the cold open, I I am a sucker for cold open openings. I love when they do this. I want these rather than uh, we're stepping into this random mystery that the gang are already pretty much done solving and then they get into the movie mystery i like seeing the monster threaten people before the gang even know about the threat uh because i feel like it it really gives the monster a chance to uh kind of prove i want well kind of prove itself of like how threatening or scary it can really be type of thing uh i have to say the opening crash for this movie i really like how it's going you know, through the the lock, through the water, and yes. going, you know, going by fish and going through these sunken ships and whatever. I fully agree uh, with I will say, I will say though, for the cold open, um, I mean, we don't, we don't. Well, I guess we kind of do. I just kind of, kind of wish we didn't see, uh, Shannon be in the cold open. But I mean, I do get why, you know, because she's kind of like, oh. You know, she she kind of carries the the story of like, yeah, there's been this Loch Ness monster, blah blah blah. Uh, but I don't know something about it. I just kind of wish Shannon wasn't in the beginning. So then she's kind of, uh, I don't, I I guess experiencing the monster firsthand with the gang, so to speak. But then my worry with that too is that she might be like, oh no, it's not real. Everybody's just saying it around town. Ha ha ha. So I don't know. I'm a little mixed. I don't know why I don't want Shannon in the cold open, uh, but I do like the, the whole cold opening and, you know, their boat is wrecked and everything. Then there's this mysterious dude who's like, you know, warning everyone on the boat about the Loch Ness Monster. I, I think it gives a good feel. And then I love the whole like, so it's it's eerie at the beginning because, you know, the monster just attacked them and everything. Then you transition to the gang, like, you know, another, a new day, the gang are driving to the castle, and it's bright and sunny, and the music's all of a sudden changed, and I really like that transition of, like, okay, something really scary just happened, and it's, you know, they, they almost just drowned and whatever, and then now we have this complete other side of, the gang doesn't know anything about this, they're going on vacation, you know, so it's bright and sunny, and woohoo! So there, there's my two cents on all that. No, I agree with everything that you are saying there. Um, just even so, starting with the titles, like you said, the water effect is really good. It's so fitting. I even like how before anything comes up on the screen, the first thing that you hear is bagpipes. So very kind of true yes. Scottish vibes there. Like uh huh. Before you see a single word, a single title, you hear bagpipes playing. It's like okay, good. Well, I I get that. I also love how right at the very beginning we're seeing the surface of the water and then it goes into the water. Yeah, but, but, but again, a really good point because like you start to see for all the Loch Ness is associated with water, it does kind of expand beyond that. So just dual perspective. And also, I kind of get what you were saying about having Shannon as the cold opening. There was maybe more character development that could have happened with her as opposed to just throwing them in right at the start i do quite like their character though i will admit i like how there's similarities with daphne but they haven't like decided that it was a necessity to go for that over kind of girly vibe kind of thing like she clearly put some working arranging the festival which is quite sporty the hair's obviously like not as flowing as daphne's that kind of thing i like how they've mm -hmm. not been kind of choose like they've kept a lot of similarities with the color scheme and things but i do feel like in terms of some personality traits they've not been too scared to kind of push it away from almost making it her twin i'm almost yes, getting the sure. vibes of um mystery incorporated where she has a sister in the army i think yeah right 
So uh-huh. I kind of get that kind of feeling from Shannon. My issue with this, though, is that, and I do like all of this, I agree with what you're saying in terms of the positives, but again, it's like, I think someone on the boat with Shannon makes a joke like, you know, if this goes well, maybe, like, the Blake family will be known for more than just getting kidnapped. And that's kind of funny, that's a nice line, and it comes back later as, like, it's just a whole generation of damsel in distress. <laughs> yeah. But at the <laughs> same time, I feel that that kind of takes away from Daphne's originality like obviously being the damsel in distress whilst it isn't an original concept it's kind of like is it meant to be more inspiring that Daphne is you know breaking a generation long trend or is it just a preset thing like I don't know it just it took away a bit for me personally from her story arc in the previous movies that it isn't just that she was landed with bad luck it was predetermined even before she joined mystery yeah yeah and i know you're speaking about the kind of old man on the boat jb referred to him as a creepier version of lester from it was just like a oh my hat true (laughs) he just looks so creepy and i don't understand like what are they in the movie i know they come back they're like the dock master but do they have a stake in any of this i don't think they do ultimately do they they're just a believer Okay, that was that was my other thing I was gonna bring up is okay, I get he was kind of there for the vibe of that moment and that's I believe he comes in again for another but like he does nothing to the plot. He's just there. We don't do we even get a name for him? I think he's is it Duncan the Dockmaster or is that another character? Maybe. Duncan McGovern, maybe Duncan that's what it McGovern. is. Duncan McGovern, maybe. <laughs> I don't know. He just shows up to be a bit spooky. Like, yeah, they, they, there's this strange. group, there's this boat of people that have just had a serious accident, and this guy's like, oh, <laughs> yeah. you guys deserved it. Like, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I think another really good point that Smash raised about like, the intro and things is that dark and light contrast. We saw it um, in the Cyber Chase as well, where you get the cold opening, it's kind of nighttime, it's, cu- it's quite dark. And then it cuts to the gang driving peacefully through the countryside and it's really light and bright and you just get that distinction and they've done it a couple of times and I think it works really well. Yeah, it's very formula, formula centric, but in the best way possible. Like they found like their groove now and I think at the start they're showing that, oh, you've got the great cold open and then the gang driving into a new location. And I think that that works really well and it does that here as well. Yeah, I like it. And then we get to the part in the mystery machine, which I did already mention, where Velma says that she believes in the Loch Ness. Now, like, I do find this interesting. We've mentioned it a bit, but I guess I just want to say a little bit more because, like, I just, I'm, I find this one particularly interesting because it's something relatable. Like, I know people who've gone to, gone on holiday to the Loch Ness, like, oh, we're going to look out for the monster. Whereas you've got other ones, like, say um legend of the vampire like you know people in australia aren't like oh i'm gonna head out to vampire rock it's i find it really nice to have something relatable it's kind of nice that velma's character alters to fit with that maybe kind of almost rectifying some of the mistakes that we talked about in the monster of mexico where they referred to it as was it mexican halloween or something yeah mexican halloween yeah Yeah. they certainly seemed more informed this time with what it was that they were discussing because Again, it, it this is one where it relates to things that other people can actually have some associations with. You know what? I random little thought. You know what? I really want Velma to be. I guess I really would like you know because like the Loch Ness monster, so to say, and like the Abominable Snowman, Bigfoot, and whatever are like you know these big legends that you know we've heard stories for the end of time about and whatever. And I kind of would really like Velma to be a uh, person who, you know, has heard these stories and whatever, and she doesn't believe in them, but she also doesn't not believe in, like, those big legends, and, like, she wants to find the truth of these big legends, and so she's, you know, doesn't deny that they might be real, but until, you know, she gets hard evidence, she's like, 
and it's just a legend. Anyway, random thought because we're talking about the Loch Ness monster. No, I agree with that. And I you agree. do need that kind of dynamic. You know, Fred's the leader, Scooby and Shaggy are the kind of heart and the comedy, and Daphne's the fighter. There does need to be that person that pushes things forward. Like maybe Velma isn't necessarily obsessed with debunking ghosts or obsessed with proving ghosts, but more obsessed with finding the truth of that particular instance and I, mean, I do like that yeah i'm gonna be skipping here to almost the last line of the movie but she does say at the end words to the effect of i'm kind of glad we didn't find the real monster or something yeah like that. yeah mm -hmm. i think that's quite relevant in terms of what you were saying there like you yep. know there's some level of belief did she really want to disprove it? Does she want to believe? Because the the vibe that you normally get from her is that she doesn't want to have any possibility that this is real. Whereas this, yeah. time, this time there was just something different with Valma that I almost found her more engaging than... Oh, I don't know, sometimes she can be a bit quite... Like she feels right about everything and it can get a little bit over, yep. overwhelming and a bit annoying on occasion. Mm -hmm, but with this, sure. it was very much like a okay, I'm not going to say that I know this is fact. We're going to look at this kind of objectively a bit more. Definitely a different angle, and I think, I personally think a big improvement. I agree, and there's, like, tension in that as well. Like, there's that quote, um, this is not, like, the exact quote, but it's, like, when you rule out everything that's possible, then the answer must be impossible. And for Velma to have that approach, like, if it got to the point where, like, the gang was genuinely in that situation where Velma, even if she's wrong at the time, admits that it's possible that there is some supernatural element there, that's just going to bring stakes anyway. Like, they can have the kind of fun moments, but for Velma to physically get to that point, again, will just indicate something more than just what you'd see on the TV shows. It would make it seem like this is a bigger scale. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so like I said, I did skip forward to like the last line of the movie, so dragging <laughs> it really far back. Um, them arriving at Blake Castle and then the kind of chase scene at night, I think, is kind of the next thing that I've got on my notes now. That chase scene, don't know why, but it is for me one of like my most prominent Scooby Doo memories. I sing the song like um, since we did our watch through of this, I've been singing the song so much. But one <laughs> thing I'd forgotten about is how terrifying the Loch Ness Monster looks in this movie. Like, the bright red eyes, this huge figure, like, towering over the castle. I I found it quite, like, intimidating watching this years on, so how I didn't feel more affected by this as a child, I don't know. Yeah, and I cannot <laughs> decide if it's aged really well or really badly, because I love the texture, it stands out from the background, but then it also reminds me of this like really cheesy Spider-Man cartoon that I used to watch, and I'm actually <laughs> curious to get your takes on this, because just staring at pictures of this thing for ages, I can't tell if it's aged well or horribly. Like, I don't, it definitely is different. I can't decide. So, okay, so I have... This is one that released on Blu-ray. So I have it on Blu-ray. Um, and this is one of, if not the first... Honestly, anything Scooby, well, besides the live action movies, uh, that used CGI. And so the Loch Ness Monster at times is uh, a CGI, you know, animated monster rather than 2D, you know, drawn or whatever. Uh, and you, you can see that difference a lot of times. Like, I feel like it loses a lot of texture when it's CGI. But we have to remember this was back in 2004. And... Budget-wise, they probably didn't want to put a whole lot into it and stuff. Uh, I have to say, uh, one of the best points in the movie that it looks the best is Shannon telling her story to the gang when, you know, she's, like, sleeping, gets up to close the window, and it's in the window. Like, that scene freaks me out to this day. I'm like, that would be terrifying to go close a window, and there's a huge freaking, like, lizard alligator thing in your window that can just crush the wall, like... Uh, anyway, I really, really like that point of the movie and the Loch Ness Monster in that. Uh, what you were saying with the Chase song, it's funny. Have you paid attention to the words in that song? Like, I know you, you were saying you were singing it, but have you paid attention to the words? Like what, when it all falls apart, you've got to keep it, it together. Fall, like, um, all fall together or something. All fall together. That's that. So... Castles may stand, but... Da, 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 I don't know. So... 
go back okay go back to that scene and watch it but really really listen or pull up the words because that song is so funny because it is literally saying what's happening on screen when you take a look behind you what yeah. do you see and then scooby and shaggy turn around see the lot mm -hmm. there. yep <laughs> it's i don't it's know funny. i just find it a very good song like a lot of a lot of perhaps like the chase scenes are more suspenseful music this music for this movie certainly doesn't <laughs> add the same level of suspense as others do but i do feel like for me personally the loch ness monster in themselves looks scary enough to kind of accommodate to that and also it's just nice to have some music that i think is enjoyable right yeah that's interesting like every more or less every interaction besides the cold open features a song like every Loch Ness monster scene is a song for the yeah. It's part. not just it's not just <laughs> yeah. a backing track or something. It is a song for every chase scene. Which again, not really much tension in that, but there is a lot of fun in that. I think the first two songs are really quite good. The third one is uh, is okay, but for this section, I do agree. This is this is awesome. That's kind of like classic Scooby Doo though, because they they didn't start doing like these chases with music until the second second season of scooby-doo where are you and you know in the original series whenever they did play like chase music it always was these like just wacky songs that didn't oh, fit the, the mood ostrich you know it was supposed was to amazing the ostrich one and oh. you know so it it was just like supposed to be a moment of wackiness and lighten the mood you know so if kids were watching it's just kind of to have a little breather so to speak and so i kind of feel like that's what they were doing with this movie they were like okay we kind of have a scary monster so when they're running away let's just have a fun song yeah i, I guess i can see why they did that and like i said i enjoyed the music and i think it i think it like because the wording's so perfect and things it does all fit quite nicely despite it not having the same kind of mood to the music i guess but it was good yeah a lot of fun and one thing we haven't really touched upon, and we always go over the kind of outfit changes in every one of these movies. Again, there are oh, yeah. lots of new outfits here. What yes. does everyone think about that? Because I will go back to this, and this is a recurring theme. I think everyone looks pretty good. I even think Daphne's outfit, even though I wasn't really too keen on the ones from the Mook animation movies, I think this is probably the second best look for um, the animated yeah. version of Daphne. But again, Fred is just... Uh, there's just something not right. I don't, I don't know. know. I quite yeah. like that look on Fred. I don't know why. You know what's funny? We were me and my friends. We were talking about Fred's outfits, and uh, so uh, thank you guys again for that package you sent. Uh, oh. We were looking at those Scooby Doo Two trading cards, and we were looking at Fred and stuff, and talking about his outfits, his different outfits in Scooby Doo Two. And, uh, we, like, me and my friend both agreed, like, w when he doesn't have orange in his outfit, something just feels off. You know what? I don't think that that's, like, the thing that's clicked it for me, but I do feel like, like, when you mess with the core color scheme... Then again, though, Daphne yeah, is, is, is void first... of green, though, yeah. and that's not really affected my opinion. Well, no, does she have a green headband, or is it a purple headband? Purple. Oh, so... But that mm. is... So, does Fred wear orange at all in the second live-action movie? The... Really, the only time he does is, uh... There's two points in the movie where he... Because he usually has this blue jacket throughout the movie. And he takes it off at two points of the movie. Once when uh, he's with Patrick at their clubhouse, just having a drink, and then uh, when they're rewiring re the control panel in their old clubhouse treehouse thing, uh, and he has like a, a mystery ink T-shirt that has you know like blue sleeves and whatever, but the the collar, the little rim collar thing, is orange. See, it's interesting we're mentioning this because this would be this Loch Ness monster movie would have been released the same year as Scooby Doo too, right? Yep. Yes. Oh, so that's kind of a good little connective connective point there. Um, but Smash, what what do you think about the what's new outfit? Is it the kind of the same thing? Like, is the orange not good? I don't know. So, I mean, again, this is kind of the outfits that I grew up with. Uh, you know, because it was the series 
that was releasing at the time. And like this movie and the next few movies are very nostalgic for me. But, you know, and I never really thought about it as a kid. You know, I was just kind of like, oh, it's, you know, this version's yeah. outfits. I didn't really, you know, say anything. But uh, I have to agree. I mean, I like them. I like them all. But I, I have to agree that Fred's puts me off the most. And I know he is the most dramatically different out of all of them. And again, I don't hate it, but I also don't love it. Yeah, I mean, I think because the Ascot is quite like, if you rewatch a lot of Scooby things, the amount that Daphne refers to the Ascot, like, I, am I thinking of Mystery Inc. where she keeps saying, oh, you know, Freddy needs his Ascot, his, he has to have his Ascot. Yeah, his lucky Ascot. Oh. It is referred to so, so much. It is kind of like an essential part of their character almost in some regards i guess it does have a level of importance daphne's outfit for this one again i really like that yeah i guess you have to understand why they changed fred so much and i guess it makes sense in the context of scooby and shaggy i guess like scooby doesn't really wear outfits but shaggy especially is definitely the type of person that no matter what time period they're in, they're not going to care what they're wearing as long as they're in something <laughs> that they're comfortable yeah. in and that yeah. they think suits mm -hmm. them. Whereas Fred, because they're like the leader, they te they tend to be more social, more out there. They would more likely need to reflect what people see as fashion, like guys' fashion at yeah. the time then. And not just fashion. I'd go as far as to say that Fred tries to... Like Quite fit, often, yeah. when they try and do, like, some kind of hint at a relationship between Fred and Daphne, they like to have Fred pretending to be quite manly and presenting himself that way. And I think it was just a time thing. Like, if you look at the outfit that he has in this movie, it's that plain white shirt with the blue stripe across, which I think, I mean, certainly in the UK, I'd say was similar to a rugby shirt, perhaps. So that's quite sporty yeah. in that regard. It's like a polo, isn't it, almost? So I don't know if it's that kind of, okay, well, this is what the kind of time period was for this kind of dress style. I don't really know. Because I think, I mean, speaking of him being sporty, one thing that kind of called out to me is that they didn't try to be more involved in the games themselves because quite a few of them were muscle-based. We've seen his character almost want to take on that kind of athletic role before. That I was quite surprised that they didn't want to do that more here. You know, now that I think about it, that's a good point. Because you'd think, even if it wasn't to impress Daphne or something, they, they're always the type to kind of like puff yeah. their chest out a bit. And, and especially like, you know, <laughs> yeah. the outfit choice was because of an athleticism reason, like we said. Like, it does cl quite clearly, I think, to me, represent what would, you know, what the UK would call a rugby shirt. Yeah, it, it it definitely, definitely does look that So, way. okay, random story that just you guys made me think of. Uh, do you guys know why Fred has an ascot, usually? I no. actually don't know why. So, it's actually super funny. <laughs> okay, so, you know, Scooby-Doo originally came out in 1969, kind of towards the end of the year. And uh, they went through, like two or three rewrites of character designs and obviously kind of what the premise is going to be and whatever. But while they were designing the characters, there was this random surge of popularity for guys to wear ascots in the year 1969. So they said, okay, Fred's going to be our jock, so he'll wear an ascot and whatever. Well, by the time the show actually aired, that trend had already gone out. You know, I think they should bring it back, you know. Like I Right. Don't, I don't hate it. Like it's it's not I don't either. Scarf, but it's 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 like a, it just looks cool. I would wear an ascot. I, I mean, you're the type right? of person that likes to wear a tie every day though, so maybe that's why. Eh. Mm, maybe, maybe. I mean I don't really like bow ties though, so maybe an ascot wouldn't be for me, but I wanna try it at least. Yeah. We should can we get one on Am on eBay? Let's just look for an eBay one. <laughs> like a Fred Ascot. Oh wait. We'll we'll, you... we'll all oh. take a group photo. <laughs> they definitely sold some of you know you know what? No. Freddie Prince Jr. handed out like twenty ascots in the live action movie. <laughs> yeah, Someone true. Must have won. <laughs> Let's get one. It's gotta be a as like a genuine one somewhere. You know, I would I would get that. 
I'd wear it proudly. I I'd still want that standy. Oh Random. <laughs> yes, right. I'm going to leave this in the description for people listening that are a bit confused about what we're talking about because <laughs> I'm appealing to the community to help us find one of these things. We had a big escapade about that. I'm going to try yeah. and link something in the description. We need to try these down. A lady that we They've got to be somewhere. <laughs> A lady that we work with thought that JB had gone mad that night, like after you two had had that oh, conversation, because no. I'd been asleep throughout <laughs> the entire thing. And he was trying to tell me, he was like, I had an escapade last night. And I was like, what do you mean you had an escapade last night? And he's like, I had an escapade. And this woman just must have thought he was going mad because he was just using this word <laughs> over and over again. Oh, no. It was, it, he, it's our hunt for the Scooby-Doo 2 Monster than Lee standy. We're going to find one one I day. don't know if he's told you, but he started, like, emailing all the cinemas within yeah, yeah. a decent proximity. Like, did you get this in in 2000, like, 2002, 2004? <laughs> Where can we find it? I'm going to hunt down some employees at the time. I'm going to do it. I'm yeah, he make started going army. through LinkedIn to see who worked there at the time. That is amazing. I'm we we also need to, like, contact Warner Brothers. We do. You know what? And I've told you this many times, Millie. I am a man of action. Like, I don't just talk. I'm a man of action. All you do is snooze. <laughs> oh my gosh, what's happening? <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, so... Uh, sorry. <laughs> my escapade. Oh gosh. Okay, full circle back to I believe the next part of the movie, which is where we meet... Is it Fiona Pentrook, I want to say? Who's yes. that? Is that the, 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 the writer? Or is yeah, that, yeah. The professor. She's the, the woman writer. Yeah. One thing I find strange about their introduction is that they feel so at home in Blake <laughs> Castle. I don't really get why. Yeah. It's like, I'm yeah. going to sit on this chair and I know that it's a secret passage and I'm going to spin around. How do you know this? Like, It's yeah. like Velma scraping the walls of Simone's house. Yeah. Just vandalizing <laughs> things. <laughs> If anything, it, and then to that cup of tea, isn't she just sat there with a cup of tea, like spinning <laughs> around in this chair? Yeah, imagine of that, you sneak into a place, you go to the kitchen, you boil the kettle, and you like <laughs> sneakily pour it, and then tiptoe back in there, grinning. <laughs> like that's ridiculous. <laughs> And, and then the <laughs> other guy that smashes the window. Oh yeah, that, yeah. that guy needs to be put in jail because oh. he made me so angry later on. Like I've I used to work along boats a lot and and boating licenses and the stuff that this guy was doing. He he didn't know what the break was. He crashed and instead of putting down mooring <laughs> lines, he chucks an anchor right on the dog. Yeah. <laughs> to, be, uh. to be quite honest, Blake Castle does take a beating within this movie. Like it, does. it gets harpooned. It gets those like <laughs> yeah. logs thrown through the window like these stained glass windows that are obviously so expensive just get it oh. must have been thousands of pounds damage well and poor shannon is just like no it'll be fine i'm like girl that's not fine yeah i'm sure i'm sure daphne would have had a bit of fire by now and said look just stop right i guess all the blake family just must be completely loaded like just uh, for real though, they're just, yeah, they're they're on another level. They don't need to worry about things like broken castles. So my so list. My next thing on the list uh, is the scene that they have where they're eating that night. I find it quite amusing that Shaggy and Scooby refuse to eat haggis. Like. Okay, Again, no, that was just rude. That was so rude. Like, like they eat everything. They eat dog food. Okay, okay. Like, is it's okay. So Scooby aside, Shaggy eats dog food. <laughs> like yeah. Like I said, I'm I'm very near to Scotland, and there are certain hotels that you can go to where if you're there for breakfast, like haggis will be on the menu. No, I mean let's be clear. Haggis is not a vibe, in my opinion. I've it's, never tried it, and I never it, intend to. It, it it's not great. But I would say that if you've been invited somewhere as a guest. When you're presented with your food, maybe it's not the thing to do to push the food away and, like, recoil in disgust. <laughs> like, I'm surprised that everyone in this in these movies aren't villains. Like, Ben Ravencroft was made into a villain after one car journey with Velma, so... If they ever bring Shannon Blake, Bla Shannon Blake back, I predict that they're going to be the villain. And I predict Mystery Inc. deserve it. Like it's crazy. Again, there's a ton of characters that need to come back, but she's one I would love for her to come back. 
Have they ever been referenced at all in the future? No, not that I can recall at all. It's a shame. Because they always find a way to, like, pop up with different relatives for the gang. Like, we've got, like, a Hoy Scooby-Doo coming up. Or, like, Pirate Scooby-Doo. And they gave, like, Fred parents. And then in Mystery Incorporated, yep. Fred has different parents. And it's all just a bit confused. But I do like this kind of subsection of the Blake family a lot. And I guess nothing really contradicts Shannon being a part of it. Like, with Fred's parents, like, you know, there's got to be some timeline thing there. Whereas with mm -hmm. Shannon, it just doesn't matter like, what canon you're in, it could happen. So I'd like to see that again. Although I do think they've gone back to Scotland since this, and there was no mention. But I don't know. I mean, to be fair, Scotland's quite a big place, so... Yeah. I don't know that I... Yeah, the one that's at the south of England, JV. I'm sure you know that Scotland's a big place. I, I thought it was a big place. <laughs> I suspected it. <laughs> One day I'm going to Loch Ness, though. Oh. So then after that, we've already talked about the chase scene, I think, unless anybody else has got anything to add to that. Which one was that? Is that the second one? I think it was the first one that, that, the, that happened. The Brothers then. Forever one. Oh, yeah, okay, so that, that, that song is great, oh, yeah. and it has that kind of double meaning aspect to it. And then we see, I think that ends with that kind of flying Loch Ness balloon. And then we see more about the two. That's the next day. Yeah, I think this yeah. is. They go to the tent scene. Scooby does that Thor's hammer thing and bonks it on the Loch Ness monster's head. Yeah. And then everyone shows up. We also, just side note, forgot to bring up Del Chillman. Del Chillman. Del Chillman. Oh, he was like the, the baby. The Nessie guy. believer. Yeah. The... The... I don't know what the word is. The... Is it. Are they like a Nessie simp? Oh, yeah, the guy yeah. with the van. Yeah, yeah, yes. the Loch Ness machine or whatever. That's that's one of Lester's kids, though. That has to be right. <laughs> I believe it. And they've got like Jasper's glasses as well. Like, oh, I like this character. Okay, that has to be canon now. Yes. I am calling that, that canon now. <laughs> <laughs> that is canon. We're going to make a family tree by the end of this retrospective. Oh yeah, for for Jasper. It's all for Jasper. I cannot believe this. They are a good character, because I feel that it's so easy to make this character so annoying. But I I think they're alright. They're a good I, Yeah, I never felt annoyed by him. him. No, he's funny. And what do they do? So they're just... They want to protect the Loch Ness Monster, that's it. They're almost like... Yeah, like, every time there's a sighting, they're, like, packing up this stuff, like, I need to go and save them. And you yep. really feel bored of that. It's not like it's, like, a hunter or a poacher that wants to make thousands of dollars or pounds from, you know, Nessie scales or that they want, you know, any clout or praise getting the first photo of them. They're just trying to look out for the wildlife, and, hey, I'd be, I'd be a very evil person if I wasn't on board with that. <laughs> Um, okay, so, my notes here, um, Daphne's nightdress is on fleek, and, oh, good lord. no, it's funny how Shaggy's suitcase is just full of green shirts and brown pants. Yeah, I know, that's always funny. I just feel like that's a vibe, because they never do change, do they? No. I love, too, that they gave Shaggy, like, this huge nightcap thing. I, yeah, I like that as well. What are they for? I've seen them. They're just, I think they should just warm people up. Because Scotland's cold, right? Scotland's yeah. a really cold Which place. Is it another kind of stylistic choice? I really like the coats they gave them. Then from, like, the UK gets very cold. So I just like that they kind of almost cater to the surroundings a bit there. Yeah, it, when when the UK is cold, it's really cold, and unfortunately, when it's warm, it's it's just way too warm. Like, and I just like the stylistic choices they did with it. Like, Velma's almost looked like an explorer's yeah. coat, and she's obviously like very interested in anything academic and that kind of thing. Um, Daphne's was very like see through, so it didn't affect her outfit too much, which again. You know, she's very kind of fashion centered. That was almost weird though, because that to me wasn't like something to warm you up. That's like something that you'd be given just as you go through Niagara Falls, like something yeah, to like protect you. <laughs> yeah, so, true. Again, yeah, it didn't affect the outfit, but I don't know how warm that would keep her. 
No, but I, like I said, I just like yeah. how they stylize all those jackets and things. I think they're fitting well. Right. So let's see. But yeah, so I've written down. I believe that the Doc Master is, is Duncan. Yeah. And that's who the crazy Duncan person McGavin. is. <laughs> and what do they say? They're just, again, they just show up to be a bit creepy. Yeah, they just keep dropping creepy lines of wisdom on them. And, and like having a go at Fred, because Fred insists for some reason on calling the lock a lake. And yeah. it's just Duncan's job to then say, oh, it's a lock. And I don't know. Is there a big difference between a lock and a leg? Do we know that? I decided to research this before. Ooh, okay. <laughs> before wow, look at Millie. That's good. Because I was coming up with Loch Ness theories. And I believe the theories. difference is, is a lake is just one body of water, whereas a lock connects to the sea. So it said that just north of the Loch Ness, there's another lock which then connects to the sea. Because I was confused as to how they were getting all these boats into the Loch Ness, like those huge, huge boats. And so I was like, mm, I don't know. I kind of want to pick up on this if they're wrong, if this isn't possible. So I started to research it, and you would never be able to fit a boat that size through to the Loch Ness, but it does in fact connect to the sea. Can we real talk for a minute now? Like, we've all had our fun and games in this. Welcome to real time. Um, right, look. Obviously, no one... Well, I'm not claiming that the Loch Ness Monster is real, okay? But are we thinking that it, it has to have been real at some point, like in the world? Because it could very easily just have been a plesiosaurus that survived the time of the dinosaurs. Like, we had these things in the world That at would some be point. so interesting. Like... Yeah. Like this thing is isn't some unicorn or some some massive thing. It's, <laughs> it's a thing we've had on the planet. One of them could have survived. Well, I think, like I said, my research was telling me that it connected to the sea, and it's a it's a un, like a unanimously known thing that they say they haven't even explored fifty percent of what's actually under the water. So yep. If the lock connects to the sea, it could have been that it was just spotted there it was actually this deep sea creature that by way of the tides and things almost got directed in a different way i mean that's possible we know that the that the um uh, all the way up the U all the way up the coast of the uk is very kind of pressure driven like dating back in history to like the spanish armada the tides take it all the way up north so it's very possible that drifts and stuff could have directed something in a certain route. I actually feel Highly like I'm getting unlikely. genuinely educated here. This is awesome. <laughs> <laughs> very, very highly unlikely. But like I said, the tides used to be able to take boats all the way up the north coast to the east of the UK. So I don't know if an if a sea creature got caught in that drift. And like I said, they say they've not explored like 50% of the ocean. So... It's technically not impossible, it's just improbable. I mean, it would be the, an ideal place to hide. Say if you're a plesiosaurus and the meteorite strikes and you're just like, oh, sugar, what am I going to do now? If you <laughs> hide in a lock, surely a lock is going to be more protected than the open ocean. Yeah. I think, I think the bottom line is that somebody has to have seen something at some stage. I don't think they're correct in what they've seen, and I think it's probably hundreds if not thousands of years ago that something was seen and the legends just continue yeah, but i on believe them the point. because it's like if you're gonna make up the fact that you saw a monster to sell a story to a newspaper or something you're gonna make it awesome like oh i was out on my boat um, on the lock the other night and i saw this giant red sea serpent with eight different heads and it had wings and it was breathing fire and i wouldn't say <laughs> yeah it just had like this neck thing like a giraffe i think it's genuine Okay. Because I, I know I'd make up some mad, like, Hydra type there. <laughs> but are we unanimously decided that it could be a Plesiosaurus? If it keeps I... you happy, JB. <laughs> no, I for sure feel like there it was something, you know, what it may be. Who knows? But it's, like, it's got to be something. I just think, you know, like, with how long it's been a legend, it's kind of just been this game of telephone and the stories and what it looks like has just 
sat and changed as people told stories because the details have gotten mixed up and forgotten and whatever. Yeah. And so, you know, who, who knows what it originally was compared to what we describe it to as now. And I think we're certainly at a technological stage where we could at least analyse the contents of the lock. So I think it would very much have been a circumstantial thing that it got in from the sea, maybe got out again kind of thing. Yeah. It, it, I think the t like the lock itself is completely empty. Yeah, I'm surprised that the term, though, Loch Ness Monster, hasn't been like patented or copyrighted by one of the early sighting people, because it's like... I don't know. It, it has it become that ingrained in society, like it's just like a Bigfoot, like everyone just knows it. I'd say that it was that common. But yeah, I agree. It's a bit of a tangent, but it's like when you're discussing something like this, like we spoke about, you know, the real origins or of the Chubacabra last episode, and now it's like. I don't know. I'm just fascinated when we get to speak about these monsters that there is that there could be something about them. Well, that's I I also love, you know, these types of conversations and ideas because again, it's I feel I mean, yeah, you you could argue about them whatever, but I feel like it's more these are open discussions and so, you know, you can come up with different theories and ideas and stuff and like uh we have a movie coming up uh, Scooby-Doo Pirates Ahoy, where they go to the Bermuda Triangle, and, like, that's such a fun conversation, and I even have a whole book on different theories and quote-unquote happenings that have happened in the Bermuda Triangle that, you know, I like to read just because I think it's fascinating what people think, you know, they saw happen or they've experienced and whatever, and, yeah, no, I for sure, we are definitely getting to this realm of Scooby-Doo right now where, uh, they're tackling legends, so to speak, or, uh, you know, but uh, I think I think it's going to be interesting, and I agree. I love these types of conversations and theories surrounding these types of monsters and ideas. Yeah, yeah I could talk about this thing for hours. I'm not going to, but just <laughs> just thinking about the amount of times I've typed on YouTube, like Loch Ness Monster sightings or like Sea Serpent sightings, and just like going, oh, that's awesome, like... I just, I just love the fact that there is such a tangible monster in this movie because there's other times where you can just switch your brain off a little bit. Like, obviously, this is a great villain, but, like, the space kook, at no point am I like... You know, I, I understand aliens. I do believe that there must be something, but at no point I'm like, oh, like, it could be the space kook out there, you know? Like, <laughs> yeah, it's true. It's on a different level. Yeah. It's something so similar yeah. to what we know has existed. Like, there's literally plesiosaurus bones in most museums that you'll go to that's, like, history. And it's like, yeah, they, they could be. I mean, it's it's impossible that the meteorite killed everything, right? Like, what was the meteorite made out of? Was it nuclear? I don't know. They say it's interesting, and as Smash was saying, it's going to be good, the conversations that arise, because, again, the Bermuda Triangle, something that JB especially has been really interested in, like, it used to be, I don't know if it still is, like, a bucket list yeah, place to go. List. It's scary, though. Not but... sure that I want to join you, but it's certainly your bucket <laughs> list place to go. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, if we live stream it, no matter what happens, <laughs> even if we go out, we've we've uncovered the truth. As long as you can get service out there, you get you can get like four G, isn't it? Oh god! Um, so <laughs> he's like, no. <laughs> I'm like JB's going on his own. <laughs> so this movie, like, obviously, I've had a lot of positive conversations. I'm very nostalgic about it. I've said a lot of good things. There's one perhaps more negative thing here that I'm going to point, and that is, um, you know when there's the, like, big balloon scene, um, and she, and, Shuby, Scooby and Shaggy kind of crash to the floor <laughs> at the end of that, and instead of it being a crash scene, it cuts to this, like, red and yellow, like, pow sign thing. That was yeah. something that was just a bit like, okay. It was a bit jarring on my yeah. eyes, but... I don't know. I was yeah. just enjoying the movie a lot, and I feel like that started to take away from it. What is this balloon scene exactly? Is it when it's the two siblings the, having I mean, a... Yeah, it's the two brothers that I personally find a little bit annoying. 
Yeah, are like yeah. fighting over a balloon and then one's like, huh, I'm gonna let go of it so the other one like starts to fly away and then Shaggy and Scooby are like, oh, this looks fun and they jump on it and ultimately crash to the floor. My thing with this is I feel like this could have been done better as a, a background hijink. So like they're the, you know, Fred, Daphne, Velma are having the conversation with uh, this guy and his two sons. And then in the background, if you pay attention, you just see Shaggy and Scooby, you know, like going back and forth, trying to hold on to the balloon. And then, you know, the conversation ends and they crash. And then, and, you know, maybe the weird old guy, uh, whatever Loch Ness guy comes out and is like, what are you doing around the lock and whatever? I don't know. I just feel like it could have been a background hijinks more than a whole scene of them flying away. Yeah. To me, I don't know. It sparks, uh, like, not too long afterwards, there's another scene that kind of... I don't know. There's just a little series of about five minutes here where my opinion of the movie does lessen slightly. Like I said, and, you know, you were saying as well, it goes through this long-winded scene that's maybe not necessary... To then have this strange little cartoon red and yellow thing flash up on the screen to symbolise they've crashed. And then not too long after that, another kind of technical like visual issue that I have is they want to split up and look for clues. So Fred, Velma, Daphne are like, right, we'll steer the boat. Shaggy, Scooby, you take the mystery machine. And when they start driving the mystery machine, they drive forward, they crash... But then they are driving back in from the back of the screen, if that makes sense. Whereas they'd need to reverse, right? They, they couldn't have gone round in a full circle because the water was to one side of them. Really? So it, it's just a little visual thing that I had a little bit of an issue with. I don't know why. But like I said, I'm they drive forward, attention. crash, and then they're coming back in from the back of the screen, like, in the direction that they were going to crash in again. Is that when they're in, like, the kind of quicksand almost? Like, no, 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 it's when they're about I'm to... I'm going to hurry and look it up. Dark. I totally thought they bat, like, they accidentally had it in reverse and crashed, but I'm going to hurry and look it up. Maybe I've got oh, it wrong, yeah, but I feel um... they drive forward, crash, and then drive forward again. That's I mean, I'm not saying you're wrong at all. I just want to see now, because I'm curious. Is there, is there, like, clips of this stuff? Just chilling online. I'm sure there is on YouTube. That's where I'm looking. I, I, I kind of want to see it because I feel like I might have got it wrong. But like, I don't know. I often pick up on just like little almost mistake things because I don't know if, why. If I find it, I'll send you the clip. Another part that I find funny about this scene, just kind of moving it on a bit while we look for these clips, is just how understated some of these performances are. Not in like a bad way, but it's just so funny how eventually Shaggy and Scooby manage to find themselves in a situation where they've been chased by the monster. Again, to another cool song, but the, where the mystery machine physically falls on top of the boat that the rest of the gang are at, and Fred's just like, someone needs to check his license. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> there is, while they're in charge of the mystery machine, there's another little bit that I like. So, um, Shaggy sings that song, was it? He says, I'll take the the rocky road, okay? And I okay. used to have a music teacher from Scotland, and like, there used to be this, I think it's like almost like a Scottish folk song, and it's like, you take the low road and I'll take the high road and I'll be in Scotland before you or something like that. And she used to make us sing this in music all the time. So for him to be, like, rewording that song, I was like, I get that reference. I don't know if it's, like, a common thing that many people would get, so I was quite proud of myself. You know what's funny? Okay, so I had... I played this movie yesterday, uh, you know, just kind of as a little refresher. I didn't totally pay attention to it, not gonna lie. just kind of had it in the background, but... Uh, I was with Mariah, and uh, this that scene came up, and I just was like, I don't think we were really mid con conversation, but I just like stopped everything. I was like, this is my moment, and this what yeah, Shaggy's little tune. I can I quote that so much. It's not even funny. I don't know why it has stuck with me for so long, but I'm always just randomly, you take the high road, and I the rocky road like rocky road ice cream that is it's just stuck with me it's good like i said again just like a nostalgia thing like i don't know i feel like i don't know is it known 
is it a well-known thing like the actual version of that song or is it that they've actually done their research with this movie because like we said with the monster of mexico it was like there was some things missing whereas just that small detail i actually really appreciated that uh, I, I'm trying to think because the tune sounds familiar to me and I'm trying to get the words, but it's like, yeah, da, da, yeah. I know the tune. I know the tune. It, it's a song and it is dedicated to one of the locks. It's not Loch Ness, it's Loch Lomond, I think. Mm. Um, but yeah, like, like I said, it's just like, I feel like they did the research with this movie and JB's just checked and I was actually wrong about the crash thing. They do go backwards and then drive forwards i thought they drove forwards and crashed so i, I was wrong about that but yeah the song I um really appreciate also speaking about the mystery machine someone brought this up they were doing like a live stream the other day and i was just kind of you know listening and uh they were talking about this movie which i thought was funny because i was like oh we're gonna talk about this one this week uh but they brought up something and now i can't unsee it and it's gonna bother me forever but we are in the little era of Scooby-Doo where they don't put mirrors on the mystery machine. Oh my god. How have I not noticed this? So <laughs> you were analyzing. JB bullies me for this, right? So, little oh, side no, crack let's not here. do this. Let's not my, <laughs> my dad is a very, like... My dad's a very specific driver with, like... It annoys my mum. Basically, he used to drive, like, lorries and stuff, so you couldn't see out of the back mirror. You literally had to just use the side mirrors. Yeah. So he has this issue when he's driving where if she's trying to read a book and it even slightly blocks one of his mirrors, he's like, put that book down! Yeah. And so, like, and I drive a little bit like my dad. So, like, <laughs> JB finds it hilarious. And, he's always, and, like, if ever I'm driving and I'm winding him up, he'll just say the word mirrors to me just to belittle me a bit. I don't know <laughs> how I've not picked up that the mirrors are missing on the mystery machine. I just think it's ridiculous yeah. that I can't read. When you can't you... read. No. <laughs> no, 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 no. You might not know where Scotland is, but you can oh read. Oh, my gosh. That's Go mad. to the back seat, JB. <laughs> I actually have offered to do that before, but it was apparently it wasn't the thing to suggest. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh my gosh legit i at first when you said that though, i thought you meant that they'd added the mirror pads in but they didn't add the mirror such so it was just straight green <laughs> you're right it is no. literally just like a box and then yeah. nothing to the side yeah. and it's gonna be like this for the next few movies and now i'm like why did you point that out i'm never not gonna do that now oh no like I said, with with my mirrors issue, I'm gonna it's gonna it's gonna be very difficult watching the next few. Do they even have like a, <laughs> an uppity mirror? What the middle one? Well, the one that's inside um, that you. Oh, they've got to. Yeah, right? the rear view mirror. Yeah. But I'm pretty sure they do. It's with certain variants of the mystery machine. You can't see out of the back because the doors are solid. So what good's that? Actually, yeah, our true. Mirrors, our mirrors are a solid thing with. With the mystery machine, because I'm just looking at the Corgi model from the first film when there's no mirrors. No, that certainly would have had mirrors. I don't know if that's well, just yeah, a but Corgi it's... issue. Maybe a Corgi issue. Uh, so another little reference that I like, kind of around that mystery machine landing on the boat kind of time, is that while Fred, Daphne and Velma are on the boat, they decide they want to try and catch the Loch Ness Monster. And mm -hmm. I kind of get a little throwback to like Jaws in this when they're like talking about how they want to try and catch this giant monster with a little boat and like I don't know I just kind of drew a parallel to Jaws there where they think they can catch the shark with that tiny little fishing boat thing yeah true yeah just, just why do they me. want to catch them is that do they genuinely suspect that it's an entity to be to be unmasked or are they just being a bit a bit awful like I understand. Yes. I think it's just kind of in their blood now. <laughs> yeah, I guess so. Because, like, I don't know, like, it doesn't... I mean, I'm saying this, but I'm also wrong. But, like, does it pose... It doesn't really pose too much of a threat to be like, oh, we want to get this out of the water kind of thing. I don't know. Another thing, right, so, like, in terms of my notes, I'm actually up to what JB said now about the mystery machine landing on the boat. Another kind of visual thing that annoys me 
the mystery machine bounces like the boat's a trampoline. It does, up, yeah. Down, up, down, rest. As uh -huh. opposed to it would have fallen through the boards. It would have broken oh, the yeah. boat. And it's just there oh, yeah. like it's a little bouncy castle. And I'm be like, okay. I don't really like that. But why have they done it like that? Because I understand it's obviously it's a cartoon. Yeah. Don't think about things too deeply. But then... But I'm at sorry. the same time... Like... At the same time, the mystery machine falls to pieces pretty much in the next <laughs> scene so it's, yeah. it, it's robust enough to take this huge fall and bounce and recover perfectly fine but then all of a sudden if you break too hard the entire shell of the car flies forward into the bog of something yeah, just, yeah. Just, just, i, just I always thought that was so me. weird like I always thought it was so weird how it just broke, <laughs> you know, like the whole freaking thing just came off and went into quicksand. Yeah. Although, is it this movie, and I wrote this down earlier, but I didn't like mention it. There's something that happens to the mystery machine a bit early on. And Fred's like, oh my gosh, I've just had like my baby's, you know, tires done or whatever. And it reminds me a lot of like how Fred would later become obsessed yeah. with the mystery machine, and I think this may be one of the first signs of that. Yeah, I think it's just before he let Shaggy and Scooby take it. Yeah. Oh, uh, like, no. So it's uh it's when they're they're driving because they're they're driving to the castle and Scooby sees the Loch Ness monster and so Velma's like, "Can we get a little closer?" So then. Fred doesn't pay attention to where he's going, and they drive off the cliff into the water, and he's like, oh, I just got it hot waxed. Oh. Yeah, that's it. And he got the So it's before they off. even met Shannon. <laughs> yeah, that, okay, that's canon. It got ripped off right then. <laughs> <laughs> oh, some, imagine that, though. Like, And here's the thing. I enjoy speculating because for all i don't believe for one second that the animators of the movie or the people doing the story have thought okay we're gonna set some seat of fred to get obs increasingly obsessed with the mystery machine so that, yeah like, by the time curse of the 13th ghost comes around he and or, or like return to zombie island fred's just gonna be like aching for the mystery machine like, i don't think that for a second <laughs> yeah but no just to look back on things retroactively as a linear storyline like I just enjoy, and I think you do this smash on Legend of the Podcast, like, I would love for in my own head to find, okay, this is the order, this goes after that, almost like the Pixar theory, I'm not sure if you're familiar with that. Yeah, uh-huh. At some stage, I would just love to go and sort things out in terms of canonicity, because I do think that there is a way for it to work, and I just like seeing it. Mm-hmm. So this is where, unfortunately, my notes are kind of a bit mm -hmm. all over the place. So I'm kind of going to have to rely on um, on everyone to, to well, kind of hold me up a bit. In I this think session. the last thing you've written, which for your notes, which um, we've not touched on yet, is how much you like the underwater sequences. I personally really like these um, because, like we were saying earlier, they say that they've not explored like 50% of the ocean and all that kind of thing. And the... And under the water they start exploring these little caverns and that's where they almost find what seemed to be the home of the Loch Ness. So I just find that really interesting because obviously they do say that there's all these things shut off on in the ocean that they've not explored yet. And so I guess it's kind of nice to almost have that explanation that, you know, this could almost be seen as hidden away in here and that's why it's not like an everyday occurrence kind of thing. I get that. I get that. At the same time, no, you know what? And it fits in with the story as well. Like, I, And that's another thing I like. The tone is so consistent with this. Like, nothing happens that doesn't make sense within the confines of the story. Yeah. Like, it's not like Monster of Mexico where there's, like, <laughs> you know, this Bigfoot-type monster that they've set up, and then in the middle of it there's going to be some wacky subplot where there's animatronics. They do stick to this Loch Ness Monster theme without the need for any kind of side villains mm. i guess that like later on it's revealed that there's i guess uh now i'm confused a bit now there's a later reveal that it shows that there's a prankster loch ness monster yeah and an animatronic loch ness monster is that the same throughout the story or 
is that a prank Loch Ness monster just brought in at the end, or is it? Like I a, have some issues. Sometimes the with it's that. this one, sometimes it's that one. My issue is I feel like they overcomplicated the ending far too they much. Did. Like they drove in with that stupid cover over that man's van, and it was like, if if you're telling me this is the reveal after you've had such a good movie. I'm going to be very angry. Like, I'm genuinely going to feel some very serious anger towards this movie. Do not do this. And so then they kind of left it and was like, okay, well, let, let's progress with the movie. This isn't it. And then it's like, okay, well, did you even use that at all? Like, when we see it traveling around the roads, is that the ver is that like the version that we're seeing then? Then they lift another one out of the ocean. Then there's another one running around and it's like, okay, now you've done three. This is... This is a little bit clumsy to say the very least at this point. Like, I can ex I've I've come up with concepts in my mind to excuse it. Like, okay, well, this is why. Say, for example, the professor. The reason that maybe she believes is still believes in it, even though she knows that she was one version of it, is because there was another two kicking around that she might have seen. Or, I don't know, like like I said, I love this movie so, so much that I've tried to justify it in my mind. But I feel like this end was so clumsy and really unnecessary. Like, they never explain, really, I don't think, why they did what they did with the van. I don't think there's any real reason why the two boys were pretending to be the Loch Ness. If it had just been, look, this is the professor's one, this is why she did it, I'd have liked that a lot. This this is my biggest thing problem with this movie too. Like I, overall, I think this one is a great one. I feel like it's just very classic Scooby Doo, uh, with you know heightened uh, circumstances and whatever. <clears throat> but uh, I I do just have that same issue with this ending. It's like they were I I don't know if someone was bored or they thought it was too easy or something. And they were just like, oh, well, there's a Loch Ness Monster over here. Oh, and there's one over here. Guess what? There's another one. And so I'm like, which one were we following in the very beginning? Yeah. Like, which one should I actually care about unmasking, you know? And so it it really downgrades the, the one with the professor because I'm like, she's just another one that they're unmasking now. Yes. And it kind of also ruins the whole thing at the very end of like oh but there's another quote unquote real monster you know in the in the lock exactly because is there or is it just this person saw and this one then this person saw this one and then when we see the one that's like the van the initial reveal it's like come on now we've seen this this had legs it was pretty much walking on these legs it's it's not this. This isn't possible. Mm -hmm. It was under the water. This isn't possible. I also hate that transition, I'm just going to say, because we had that whole chase, and, you know, he has feet and whatever, and then all of a sudden when they, like, yeah, stop like and the man comes roaring, yeah, and all of a sudden it's just, like, this flap and he's on tires, and I'm like, what happened to your feet? What the heck just happened? Yeah, yeah what, what all that would look like? Just, just like, loose happen? feet just dangling down as it like, gets rolled away. <laughs> saying that for that part it was the van one and if so quite frankly that's just impossible because when the van came in you saw that for all the head was detailed the material at the bottom was just like patchwork it didn't match up yeah it was just messy it was clumsy we've seen this chase scene we know that it didn't look like that so what on earth are they doing it doesn't make sense the one where mm -hmm. the boys are doing it, it's just some sticks of wood they're walking on. There's no way that that could withstand what uh, yeah. any of the chase uh. scenes. <laughs> but it wouldn't have been able to do that much damage. They'd have barely been able to wobble forward as it was. So the only one that makes actual sense is the professor's one. And I personally think that this this movie could have very easily been, say, a 9 out of 10 it was definitely on the road to doing that, but, like, just this clumsy ending drags it down to, like, a six or yep. seven. But why does the professor get off with this with no consequences? Because mm. it's clearly stated, like, when they go onto the professor's boat, like, oh, all this hardware's ancient, it's not good, you know, whatever, like, the funding's going on, it isn't new equipment, and it's like, okay, we accept that, and 
uh, and that's why you've got such a high tech Loch Ness monster because all the funding's clearly gone there. But that's still like embezzlement, isn't it? Like uh, improper use of company money or something. I mean, I guess it's her option how she spends the money if she's invested in it. I kind of like the different ending to this that the villain almost has a motive they're not just a villain for the sake of being a villain yeah. they wanted to be noticed they didn't feel noticed and i think sometimes having a compelling villain as opposed to just one that's doing it to rob a bank or something is nice um i do find it absolutely hilarious that they accept her photos at the end like oh well done this is great <laughs> yeah it's an exact replica of the material that she used for what she created how can you be like oh my goodness this is amazing well done you when she literally created this thing that looks exactly like this like come on you can't go from being a non-believer to seeing she's created something to seeing pictures of it like oh yeah they're they're real now but it seems like yep. so much risk like if she's willing to put so much time and effort into convincing someone of the Loch Ness monster surely the second that that ruse is found out everyone's gonna go oh this must be it the whole time and then it just ruins all credibility of the Loch Ness monster being real right yeah it's strange like you know like you said just the credibility of it towards it and then and we've mentioned this really early on but at the end Val was like you know kind of happy we didn't see the real one well they could have set that up so much nicer by not having all these interferences. Like, yeah, if we'd um... just seen one, and it was the professor, and she was like, look, I did this because I know there's something, but I needed to raise awareness. Whereas now it's like, yeah, but is there another one, or did you just see this one? Did you just see this one? If they'd have just mm -hmm. kept it quite linear and just had that one person... Then it would have been like, yeah, there was two. There was the one that you wanted people to realise and the one that you created to help people realise that. I almost feel like they wanted to do a real monster in this movie, but weren't, I guess, allowed to. And that kind of stemmed to having multiple Loch Ness monsters. That's just kind of how I feel. Yeah, because yeah, this is so reminiscent of... Which is Ghost and oh the other one where it's it's kind of like a double reveal. There's a fake out where oh it's a mask the whole time and then it's the real one and it this would have yeah kind of yeah into that category like oh my gosh it was just this person trying to prove the likeness monster oh but then what's that and it's the real one. See, yep. I think because of the kind of gravitas that the Loch Ness monster has. I feel like they couldn't fully debunk it as an unmasking. Yeah. Uh -huh. They did need to have some element there, but like Smash said, it's almost like the producers weren't happy with the level of how they wanted to address that. I do think it could have just been done really nicely. Like we were saying, look, here's one reveal, but there's this one that the woman wanted them to notice. Are we thinking, though, that the people behind this movie would actively say, we don't want to debunk the Loch Ness Monster in case it offends people in Scotland, a year after being quite offensive to people in Mexico? But maybe, I mean, Smash will know <laughs> the community a lot better than we do, but yeah. I imagine there was maybe some backlash from that, and that's why there's been such an improvement with this one. Like I said, they seem to have been very traditional and very reminiscent to some Scottish things, so, like like I said, the use of that um, old Scottish folk song about the high road and stuff, like... I feel like that was a certain level of research, a certain level of respect that they certainly didn't pay to the Monster of Mexico. So my guess, and I'm hoping Smash can confirm this, is there was maybe some contro controversy with how they approached the Monster of Mexico that almost made them put a little more effort in with if you're going to do something that links to something real, you need to do it properly. Mm -hmm. I think what... It's kind of happened. Uh, so, because the last two movies, like we were talking about, uh, the the guy behind the movies were so, so focused on making it so much more of classic Scooby-Doo, where are you? We have the original voice actors, as many as we can. 
uh, you know, before we have to move on to this what's new kind of era and whatever. And so I have a ton of more thought and effort to actually doing research and kind of developing the story correctly for these next movies uh, than, you know, making sure we make it, you know, classic Scooby-Doo, where are you, you know? So I think just a lot less energy and time was uh, uh, spent on, you know, making sure all the schedules fit for these, you know, older voice actors and actresses and whatever, and more into, again, developing the story, doing the research for Scotland, and, you know, kind of uh, putting a realness to this legend, I guess you could say. Yeah. Like I said, I think it was all done. It's certainly in contrast with the Monster of Mexico, the Loch Ness kind of plot was done quite respectfully, quite nicely. I think that there was certainly some nice tributes to Scotland there. I would personally say that they did a very, very good job. Yeah. I like this. Which a lot. I think is almost prompting that we're reaching some kind of conclusions and ultimately that rating of smash or pass so before we reach that stage is there anything either of you would like to say i guess sorry to interrupt maybe the one thing that we didn't touch upon too much is and i guess in the grand scheme of things it's maybe because it was actually quite insignificant was um the captain of the boat when they were about to launch the plan kind of rebelling like oh we're gonna catch this thing anyone any thoughts on that um, I just questioned the motive behind it. Is it just to disprove? It was for money, they said. Uh, I think. Yeah. Yeah, that was shady. And they, again, don't they get off with things quite lightly? Like, Yeah, there's no consequences do. mentioned mm -hmm. there. It's quite difficult because I think they tried to wrap this movie up almost positively. Like, I think, you know, we said at the start, they almost jumped into this. They maybe introduced Shannon too early. Whereas with this one, I feel like they tried to give it the conclusion that maybe it deserved. Like, we're going to show that the games went forward. We're going to show that um, the professor kind of got their moment kind of thing. I think they tried to end it quite nicely. But maybe in trying to end it nicely, they did miss out on consequences. Like, you know, quite often it's a, oh, if it wasn't for you and these meddling kids as they get carried away in handcuffs kind of thing. I mean, just putting on, like, my legal head, well, the little legal head that I have for a minute, I guess you could argue that every <laughs> negative consequence from this movie would have to be actioned by someone. For example, Shannon would need to bring some type of lawsuit against the scientist for damages to Blake Castle yeah. versus an actual public nuisance. So, well, then again, you can't recklessly do something that could endanger civilians right and i mean yeah bricks that, falling could potentially that being said and yeah. like they certainly like i don't know if it class abduction but some certainly some form of like kidnapping that they like physically restrained them so they couldn't stop them right and then daphne gets the handbag slides down and kicks the man in the back of the head yeah, that was a good one. Yeah. I mean, I, I remember finding that absolutely <laughs> ludicrous. Like, you know, if you try and balance on a handbag, it's going to snap. But just the, the try and make her this kind of resourceful, like, female role model, it's kind of amusing. I reckon it would be possible to slide on a handbag. If the handbag's strong okay. enough and the person's light enough. The on. closest thing I've known to sliding on a handbag is when my mum got a foot trapped in one and fell on the floor. I don't, know about <laughs> that. I don't know. No, I can see the smile on your face. You do know about that. <laughs> so yeah, I think that's all I've got to say about Scooby Doo and the Loch Ness Monster. Besides the verdict, does anyone else have anything to add? I don't. I just have a few more things. I like it when Smash does um, that. It normally means there's <laughs> some good theories coming up. Uh, okay. So I, I first want to comment on what you guys were saying. I definitely agree. I feel like this movie they were. Trying maybe a little too hard at the end to be, like, happy ending for everyone, you know? Like, yeah. and, you know, I, there is, there's a What's New Scooby-Doo episode that we did over on my personal podcast uh, not too long ago. Uh, where the monster, they were on a movie set and blah, blah, blah. I mean, the monster, like, literally almost murdered, like, everyone that it attacked and whatever. And yet... All the criminal got was 
oh, it's okay. It was all used with movie effects. And yeah. we were like, no, Velma almost fell to her death. But okay, you know. And that always, like, bugs me when they're just like, oh, they just get a don't do it again type of thing. I'm like, no, they are an adult. Go to jail. Yeah, and I mean, but, JV was mentioning, and I'm sorry, I've only just thought of this, jail, do not but pass like, jail. not only was the damage done to Blake Castle, but all the, to that state-of-the-art submarine thing. Yeah. The yep. cameras fully mm-hmm. came off that, all the lights came off that. <laughs> that is yeah. so much criminal damage, it's insane. And it like is. you said, mm-hmm. it's, ju- it's just a... Oh, well, she's got photographs. Yay. You know what? <laughs> yeah. I would love to see a series. I don't know if you um, are familiar, Smash, with a YouTube channel called The Legal Eagle, but they do a series where they go through, like, crimes committed in movies. I would love to see them do a Scooby Retros, but in fact, we I should do one. Scooby. I don't think I've got enough funny. legal knowledge to do that, but I would certainly like to attempt it. Crimes committed. <laughs> Lunar by games. the gang alone like <laughs> trespass um well i mean you can't like okay, i'm not even gonna get into that because i'm just gonna make myself sound ridiculous <laughs> uh the other thing i wanted to bring up is uh the this movie i guess you could say they kind of started it with monster in mexico but like i just really feel it more in this movie they you know they're in scotland and yet i feel like they go to so many different places, you know. They have the underwater cavern, and uh, they have the the town, you know. And there's just so many places rather than just Blake Castle that they're in and stuff. Where I f- really feel like today's Scooby movies are really, really missing out on them, like exploring and searching for clues elsewhere than their main place. Like the most recent one, as of recording this, is uh, the Sword and the Scoob, and you know, they went um, to England, and I feel like we really only ever saw them in this, like, a, a cave for a moment, and then the the fake castle, and, like, that was it. And I'm like, I miss them really exploring and going deep, and, like, there's a movie coming up, uh, The Samurai Sword, where they're in an airplane, and they go to, like, this... Uh, ancient temple cave at some point and you know so i don't know i just i really like this about this movie and the the next few movies coming up is uh they really really took the time to develop the scenery and the the settings for the characters to explore and uh that's kind of something i feel like they're missing out on on uh the more recent scooby movies and i really would love them to do that more especially because i feel like now, uh, you know, with the new animation style and, uh, you know, being HD and whatever, uh, the backgrounds and the scenery could look so, so pretty uh, in these new Scooby movies, but they're missing out on what they used to do. Yeah, mm, I would agree with you. This, they utilized the set quite well, the surroundings quite well. Like I said, coming into this, I wanted to do a bit more research because I didn't actually know that much about the lock. And when the driving up the lock like that in itself is quite realistic in that there's a stretch of road that almost goes across the country to the coast and i don't know just researching it i could kind of see some of what they've done i think personally think that this is one of the more respectful representations of something yeah for sure there's been like a huge huge respect this time because i just feel like anything that we've criticized maybe in terms of other movies that they've not done well i feel like a lot of it was rectified here mm-hmm. yeah so i think that leads us on to our ultimate decision and verdict of the movie be it a smash or pass so as always we're gonna start with jb jb would you smash or pass this movie and what's your reasoning So, surprisingly enough, I actually don't really have a whole lot of nostalgia with this movie. I'd say it's the outlier that I'd had nostalgia for every single one leading up to this, and for the next three or four, but for some reason this one just flew under my radar. I only see it a handful of times, so it's not that I've got too much bias to this, but what I'll say is, and maybe this is probably the wrong thing to say, but... I would almost go as far to say that for all this isn't my favourite Scooby-Doo movie, if someone came to me and said, 
look, I can only watch one Scooby-Doo thing to convince me that I'm going to continue and watch the others. This may be my top three ones to recommend because it's so much of that Scooby-Doo formula to a point that it isn't a negative. It just does what a Scooby-Doo movie should do. There's a compelling monster. There's fun chase scenes. There's some good character moments and some comedy. And so this to me is a very, very obvious smash. Okay. And yeah, for all that's not my favorite, it would definitely be one of my most recommended ones. And so I'll hand over to Millie. Like, and I kind of know what your answer might be, but I'm going to ask you, <laughs> no Millie. Wonder. Would you smash or pass <laughs> Scooby-Doo and the Loch Ness Monster? So I guess, like, I was trying to give it a, a numerical rating before. I think this movie had the potential to be a really good 9 out of 10. I think they'd set everything up so well. Like I said, I feel like they'd done the research. I feel like everything was done almost respectfully to Scotland, knowing uh, what I know about the area and that kind of thing. I think there were some really, really nice references in there um what's new scooby-doo certainly was kind of my era so like i really appreciated the daphne outfit in this i think that was quite typical of what i would associate with scooby-doo i like the songs i don't know what it is about this movie i i don't know how it happened but this is the one that when i was watching a scooby-doo movie and i never owned any of them on dvd but this was always the one that was available to me be it on boomerang or whatever so it just is the one that I associate with my childhood so, so much. As I said, it could have been a 9 out of 10. The ending, I think, was dealt with quite poorly. And that does bring the rating down a lot. But ultimately, there is no way in my mind that I could say this movie wasn't a smash. It has to be a smash for this movie for me. So that concludes what I have to say about this movie and JB as well. But of course, the reason that we're here is we want to know what Smash thinks. So... Smash, would you say smash your pass for Scooby-Doo and the Loch Ness Monster? All right. Uh, love your guys' reasoning. That was fun to listen to. Uh, so this one is definitely a nostalgic movie for me. I remember uh, it was one weekend when I was little and uh, my mom and sisters like went to to something they were out of town for the weekend and so it was just my dad and i and i uh, he just kind of randomly decided we're going to we're going to go search for scooby movies and i remember we went to a store here called target and uh i found uh scooby doo and the witch's ghost on dvd uh one of the what's new scooby doo volume dvds and this one uh you know so i've i've had this one for for quite some time on dvd uh and this one was really fun because they put it in a green dvd case you know to match the monster kind of thing uh anyway but then i always remember uh i had the crappiest dvd player growing up and like all three siblings well i have four no i have three siblings but only uh, two that I really grew up with because my brother was uh, so much older than us, so he was already moved out. But uh, all three of us currently in the house all had the same type of DVD player, and whatever reason, it was like such a weak DVD player. And there was always this one part on this movie that just my DVD player could not read for whatever reason. Like, it wasn't scratched or anything, and it would just always skip. And so I, like would never watch this movie on my DVD player because I'm like, it won't play and it always bug me and whatever. Uh, and anyway, so then I remember, you know, like upgrading my DVD player and finally being able to watch it all the way through without skipping parts and whatever. But uh, anyway, random side story about this movie. Uh, so, but my thing with this movie and the next couple movies, well, first of all, with this movie, like we said already, I just it it does so well until the the reveal of like three or four different Loch Ness monsters. I'm like that really really brought it down for me. Uh, but the fact that it doesn't happen until the very end, basically, I'm like I I still hold it in higher regards because overall the movie is so much fun. It is definitely like a classic Scooby Doo 
feeling movie just in you know this new generation basically uh but my thing with again this movie and the next couple movies is they don't do anything i feel like specifically to make this feel like a movie specifically over just a long episode like i kind of wish the animation would have been a little more uh polished i guess you could say not so flat because uh you know you compare this to any episode of what's new scooby-doo and you know if you didn't know your scooby-doo you couldn't tell which one's a movie and which one's an episode and so i just sometimes feel like this these next couple movies are uh just a really long what's new scooby-doo episode unfortunately uh but uh at the end of the day i for sure have to smash this one that is awesome we absolutely love to hear that so after going from one where all three of us passed it's good to now get to a a definitive smash so i i do really really like that so i guess before we wrap up does anyone have any last things to say about this movie i think i covered it all that i had me too i'm just excited to know jb what is the next movie gonna be so if i'm looking at everything correctly the next one should be aloha scooby-doo aloha scooby-doo yes. i believe am i correct yeah Yes, Aloha Scooby-Doo. And that is a big nostalgic one for me. I've got to say, that's me maybe too. my third most watched. I want to say, like, yes, I'm really looking forward to that. So please make I'm sure excited. to tune in for that episode now. I always try and do these little sessions. I'm not going to harp on too much now. But in terms of news from the community, just to let people in the UK know that are listening, Scooby-Doo and Guess Who has recently released the first season on DVD. I think it's about five or four months later than the US release. I don't know if it is that recent, but if you're listening to this in the UK, you can, in fact, get your hands on season one physically now, which I just think is cool because... Because digital and download, they, it scares me. So please buy the DVD and stop me from feeling old. <laughs> okay, so I think that does it for this episode. Now, as JB and Smash were saying, next week is a huge nostalgia trip for them with Aloha Scooby-Doo. For me, maybe less so. We're certainly starting to reach the era of Scooby that I've maybe seen once or twice but it's not going to be a huge nostalgia trip so if like me you need a refresher on these movies make sure you get that watched ready for next week's premiere again this happens every Saturday so please make sure to stick around for that and remember to like comment and subscribe to JB, Millie and Smash.